This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Today I'm going to be talking about web fonts. Um, this is really a talk geared at anyone comfortable enough to make edits to their WordPress themes uh, for designers, for power users. So hopefully you guys fit into that. Um, I'm Mel Choice. Um, I'm an apprentice at Fresh Tilled Soil. We're a UX firm in Watertown. Uh, they run a three-month apprenticeship program. This is a, we're the second class right now, uh, where they bring in designers uh, who are really looking for mentors. And so for three months, we get uh, we start with like a two a two-week boot camp, where we get pretty much schooled in like all different kinds of design techniques, uh, UX, uh, front-end development. And then after that, we start working on challenges and client work. And uh, it's really meant for people who have been in the, in the industry for a, a little while, but are still looking to like jump into that like solid, like, intermediate, advanced phases of their career. So uh, we're actually seeking applicants for the next class already. So if you're interested, uh, you can check out freshtilledsoil.com. So I'm a WordPress evangelist. I love to talk about WordPress, talk to people about WordPress, um, tweet about it. Um, I used to co-organize the Western Mass meetups before moving out to Boston. Uh, those are still going on. So if you're in the, like, the Northampton, Amherst area ever. You should check them out. And I'm actually uh, for hire. At the end of my apprenticeship, I will be looking for work. So if you're looking for a designer, talk to me. So how many of you have uh, worked with web fonts before? Cool. Just wanted to get an idea. Um, the web is 95% typography, and it's really true. The web is all about words. Content is king, as they say. So when the web is that much type, we really need to make sure that the type looks good. And in the past, we were pretty limited to what we could use. So we were limited to system fonts, and by and large, they were okay. But we definitely didn't have the kind of diversity that you find in print design. Print designers can use any fonts they want, but, well, especially now that we have digital fonts and not, you know, just typesetting. But now... Uh, We've started to move beyond just the system fonts. One of the early things you could do uh, to get fonts, you know, unique fonts of the web uh, was first images. You could just, you know, use an image of text, but an image of text is never really a good solution. It's not text. So it's not screen readable, so it's not accessible, and you have to, like, you have to load that image. It's not just, like, the text which automatically appears. So after that came a few different things. So there was uh, Cypher, Kufon, uh, Fleur. These were all different techniques for replacing type. Uh, they relied upon things like Flash and JavaScript. So you still had to like load in all this extra stuff just to be able to have your fonts. And they weren't really good techniques. Like especially with like Fleur, you wouldn't be able to like actually copy and paste any sort of text because it was Flash. It wasn't actually written text. So you know you still have accessibility issues. And then along uh, after that came at font face. So it's, it's been in spec for a couple years. It was really the first thing you could use to get different fonts on the web. Uh, it was awesome. I mean, it was, it was really like transformative. And since it came out, we've really seen a lot of like wonderful, unique things on the web. After at font face came Google Web Fonts. Google Web Fonts makes it actually even easier to use type on the web. So. It's a huge collection of fonts that you can use on your websites. Um, they were really one of the first places to, uh, to gather everything together, and what makes it so unique is that it, they actually host the fonts for you, so you don't even need to download the files and then host them up on your own website. You can just, uh, let's use, you just add to collection, use, and then you get code uh, to add to your website. So it really made it even easier. You like you don't have to do any of the really the writing yourself. You just copy and paste, and then uh, you know just reference them in your style sheets. So that was that was huge for the web. Um, Google Web Fonts has a few drawbacks. I mean it is they are hosting it, so it's not self-hosted. You could download the fonts and and host them yourself, and use at font face. 
but it also means uh, that you don't get like the, the speed. It might be cached already if somebody has visited another site that used a Google Web font. Um, but it's so hard to navigate. Like actually, we can go back for a sec. There are so many fonts, 617 font families. So you have to look through all of them. They have a couple of filters. You can, you know, search by these, but you can't really get very specific. So you can't be like, man, I only want a slab serif. So they don't have any kind of stop on there. They don't have what? Any kind of style book? No, not really. You you just have to like scroll through, and they keep loading forever. And then. Uh, it just, it's so hard to navigate. There's a lot of, a lot of fonts that aren't really that great. So, you know, w when you're working with Google Web Fonts, you need to make sure that you're very careful about the fonts that you pick um, because they might look terrible. <laughs> it's kind of the same problem you had when you, you know, we, when you had search, uh, sites like uh, Defont to search through. It's not really curated. It just kind of anyone can submit their own fonts, so you don't really get the, the kind of quality fonts that you'd find at a tight foundry. But then along came TypeKit, and that kind of all changed. TypeKit is a paid service. Um, it's fonts from a bunch of different font foundries, um, and it's a it's a paid service. So you do you pay a uh, subscription. Uh, you can choose a couple different levels. Um, but I like I fall in love with it. Uh, TypeKit uh, was acquired by Adobe, uh, I think last year. So. They're kind of helping you uh, integrate it into Adobe Creative Cloud. So if you're using Creative Cloud, you actually already have uh, an account at TypeKit. Uh, TypeKit is awesome if you kind of know what you want. Um, but if you're making mockups for clients, unless you own physical copies of the fonts, you can't test them out yet. Hopefully that'll change now that Adobe owns TypeKit. I mean, I've, I've been hoping for integration into Photoshop itself for a long time, but it's, it's not there yet. So if you own copies of the, the fonts, you could do that for client work, but I've really found it great for personal projects, you know, personal work, work that I, uh, you know, when I'm designing in browser instead of designing in Photoshop and then bringing into the browser. Yes? Um, I have Creative Cloud, and I don't think I've ever seen that, so it's okay. its own separate software. Um, it is, let's see. Here we go. It's uh, in Edge Tools and Services. So I think it'll just, uh, you can log, I think you can even just log into TypeKit with your uh, Creative Cloud account. You don't even need to un install anything. So, okay, so once you do that, do you, um, how do you get it in your test? I actually have a demo at the end where I'll go through adding it in different ways. Um, but it, they actually make it pretty easy for you. But like the really exciting thing is that you know you're getting like really professional print grade fonts on the web. So this has really continued the evolution from you know whatever fonts you can find for free to now you're using type foundry fonts. Do they have stuff like Optimize in there? They might. They do not. Yeah. Does. Yeah. But thank you for checking. They have uh, all of these different foundries. There are a couple that are missing. Okay. Um, there are services also like TypeKit. TypeKit was really the first and the biggest and the, the most prominent, but now most type foundries actually offer uh, web font services, subscriptions, etc. You could do uh, you can buy web font web font copies for your personal computer, and then use them. Like I think I think like the, there are some that. Uh, you can use it up until a certain number of hits. So I think there's fonts.com lets you buy fonts. Um, oh, it looks a lot nicer. And they have a bunch of different foundries. Here we go, web fonts. Oh, they even let you try it. 
but you can you can purchase uh, web font versions of it. But then uh, with something like this, it would probably be self-hosted instead of Typekit also does the hosting for you, uh, like Google Web Fonts. But there's also uh, I think my fonts. So there's a couple different services that you can you can go through. Supposedly my fonts has an optimal. Good, thank you. Yep, there you go. I've, I've heard good things about my fonts too. So now, you know, what, what can we do now with fonts that we weren't able to do even say last year or the year before? So something that's super popular right now are icon fonts. So instead of actually using individual uh, images for your icons, you can load up uh, an icon font and then you could just use that. So you can, um, some of them work in different ways. Uh, in this case, you'd actually just type uh, like A, B, whatever, and it would, it would equate, it's like almost like windings to an icon in the set. Uh, some of them are a little, a little bit different than that. Um, there's a really great icon font where you actually type out the word and then it renders the word as the icon. So you can write like pen and it'll show up as a pen. It's pretty cool. There's a, there's a lot of really great stuff going on with icon fonts right now. And actually WordPress, uh, is thinking about moving towards icon fonts for the admin icons. There's a giant discussion right now about uh, admin icons. So uh, maybe look for that in 3.6. There's also now uh, popping up some different, some different uses like graph fonts. So in this case, you can actually generate graphs by typing. So you type numbers and then you can specify like which, which like version of the font or font weight and it'll, it'll generate a, like a, a chart or a pie graph it's pretty cool. Actually, that'd be a fun demo. So you see, these are actually just numbers being drawn. So randomized. And it just totally made you a new chart from scratch. So they're, they're like really cool, innovative ways to use fonts that are just beyond type. Yeah? Are there any free resources for a graph type font? I'm not sure that there's any free ones yet. Um, this one came out, I think, last year. Uh, and you do have to pay for it. Um, but I'm hoping that in the next, especially the coming year, we'll, we'll see more resources uh, that, are, that are free. Because I like, I like free things, so um, I'd love to see uh, new creative uses for fonts beyond just type. Uh, and I think that's really where we're heading in the future. Can you explain why, why that's exciting? Um, I think that the fact that it auto-generates itself, so you don't even need to like, you don't have to like go into Illustrator and make a graph. You can just type the numbers and then bam, you have a graph. Or icons, it's great because you uh, you load everything at the same time. So instead of you know loading up a sprite and then having to like manually like position each icon on your sprite, all you have to do is like type in a word or a number or a character or something, and bam, you have an icon. Um, it's also good because it, it lowers the amount of HTTP requests you have. So if you were loading in like ten different icons throughout your site, you know you'd have to load all ten of those. Um, well, with a font, you're only loading it once. And it's infinitely scalable. So you can make them big, small, different colors, because uh, they're all vector. So you have total control over sizing and colors and effects. You could put you know, text shadows on it, or you know, give things borders. So I think it's... Would that work for accessibility also? Um, so accessibility is probably where it, it hits. There are some icon fonts that are probably a little more semantic than others and more accessible. Um, so I'm not 100% sure. Because uh, each icon button is a little different, so that's something you'd have to like research with the the one that you pick. So you know, now that you have a font, how do you make it look nice? How do you pick what's right for you? So when you choose a typeface, you should think a little bit about tone. 
is the, the font you're choosing appropriate for whatever you're using it for? So in some cases you are doing, let's say, a business website, and your type should probably be a little bit stiffer, a little bit less, you know, it should have a little bit less personality. Sometimes people get really excited by fonts, especially using like really cool new fonts that they don't necessarily think too much about, you know, is this particular font appropriate? Does it evoke the right emotions? Um, is it a little too much or is it a little too less? Some people will go for something a little bit more boring or they actually could have the freedom to do something a little bit more exciting. So if you're working on a site for children or uh, a site with like a cool theme, you could really have some fun with it. Um, right when web fonts were getting really, really exciting, like two years ago, um, a couple really great designers got together and did, let's see, uh, here we go, Lost World's Fair. El Dorado is probably a good one. So like all this is over here is type and they got really fun with it. So it's like this like super cool, crazy, almost poster on the web. And it's all done with uh, web fonts. Including the train? Yeah, <laughs> train's an illustration. So then there's Atlantis, which is fun. So all these type, all these are web fonts. It goes down, down, down. So these came out a couple of years ago, um, even. But there are so many like cool things you can do with all these new fonts that are available. Uh, another thing, is it easy to read? Oh, go ahead. So there's no issue to, uh, into converting it to print? Uh, it depends upon, um, do you mean like printing it? Yeah. Um, so you would just put it into um, like take a screenshot or like just using these fonts? Using the fonts so you'd have um, continuity between the web and print. Yeah, uh, if, you're, if you're using it for print, I would probably buy the print versions just because uh, some of the type, the web fonts have been specifically rendered for the web, so they're hinted a little bit differently. Um, uh -huh. But if something has both a, a web and a, like a standard version, I'd go for the standard so version for print. There's an option there to purchase it for. Yeah, Typekit is actually just a service for the web, but something like fonts.com or my fonts actually sells you the fonts, so you can buy them. Um, Typekit's just for web. Yeah, just for web. But all, I mean, all the fonts they have there are available elsewhere at other foundries. You can buy them either from the, the foundries themselves or from something like fonts.com. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I wanted people to be able to both see it on the screen and print it in Optima. I would have to have the two, both fonts, both the web font and the print font. If you were making uh, print resources, you would need the, I mean, you, you could use the web one, uh, but it wouldn't look as good in print as the one made specifically for print. Um, but if people just printed your website, they would see. It would look more or less like it does on screen. Depends upon how your site is laid out. Printing websites is always kind of tricky. Um, yeah. Especially like, you know, you, you might have a print style sheet or you might not or yeah. in general printing websites gets a little a little weird. That's a whole that's a whole other topic for you to do that. Yeah. Um, so readability and legibility. There are um, this is a topic in and of itself, like how to tell whether a font is, is legible, is readable. They're actually two different two different things. Um, but there's a you know, there's a couple different characteristics that make up fonts. Um, the width of them, the height of them, there's uh, especially the X height has been kind of hailed as the thing that makes it easy um, to read something. So X height is the, the height of a lowercase x in a font. Um, the higher, uh, the, the more readable it is. So Verdana was really like the accessible, readable font of the past because it has such a large X height. Uh, the smaller it is, the, the smaller it's going to appear. But um, if you're really interested in something like this, I would encourage you to read, uh, let's see. 
yeah, The Elements of Typographic Style. Um, it's a great book about typography. Uh, it'll really get into like the nitty gritty details of letter forms and uh, like it pretty much pretty much everything. It's like a, a type Bible almost. Uh, there's also a version that's just for the web that's for free. So this is actually the, the entire thing uh, for free up online. And this is just a, as it applies to the web. Yes? Do you have um, a resource <laughs> with all these links um, I, I have, I don't know that I have a, a slide for it in this one, but I can definitely pull one together and uh, I can post uh, like a blog entry and then just tweet about it. Yeah, and I can just pull all these together into one uh, one resource. So using a typeface because it looks interesting, you know, might yield acceptable results, uh, but really practicing the art of typography involves understanding typefaces and what they mean. So you shouldn't just choose a, a font because it, look, it looks interesting, it looks cool. Uh, you should really seek to understand the tone, and this is really high-level typography work here. Like, it's something that like I'm definitely still working on. Um, it's something you would learn by working with type, working with different kinds of type, uh, and really delving into it. Um, so it's something that'll take a lot of time, but now you can really just start by playing, uh, play with, you know, your personal sites, uh, do some projects, uh, even, you know, client work, you can really start delving into it. And the more you do, the, the more you'll learn. So I would definitely recommend if you're, like, really interested in type to check out uh, the elements of typographic style. Uh, otherwise, just, like, just get into it and get your hands dirty. And uh, Jason Santa Maria is actually releasing a great uh, book. Well, I'm going to assume it's going to be great uh, on uh, web typography through uh, a book apart. And that should be coming sometime in the next couple of months. Um, I'm really excited for that. And I'm sure it's going to be a really amazing resource for web fonts once it's released. But when in doubt, um, when you're really looking like, oh, God, what do I do now? How do I start? Pick a serif and a sans serif. So a sans serif is, you know, you can see above. It's pretty plain. Serif has little feet. And there's other, you know, there's other kinds of fonts. There's like slab serif, what are, which are like serif, but a little more like uh, slab-like, <laughs> a little more angular. Um, but you can't really go wrong with picking like a tried and true, like sans serif. Even something like Arial or Helvetica with a serif like Georgia would be like a really classic combination for the web. But now you have like so many, so many others to, to look for. Um, and you can use pretty much either for your body and for your headers. You know, you really see a lot of sans serif bodies with serif headers, but that's almost been reversed in the past year or so. A lot of people, uh, like back here, you can see Jason Santa Maria's own site. He has uh, a sans serif for his header fonts and then uh, serif for his body. And now uh, a list of part just updated their site. Yeah, and they do the same thing. So it's kind of been turned on its head in the past year or so. Why is that so? Um, I think it's because people really, for a while, people said to stay away from serif fonts, especially for body fonts on the web, uh, because they weren't as legible. Um, mm -hmm. But that kind of isn't the case anymore, especially now that there are so many fonts to choose from. Um, it's really like the type, the face, the typeface itself is what matters, not whether it's sans serif or serif. So now that people really have more freedom to like bring in like really elegant serif fonts, it's kind of exploded. Um, I don't really know if it's anything other than that, but how do, how do the different fonts read on um, mobile devices? Just as just as well as they do on the web, or like on a, a desktop. Yeah. 
Yeah, they kind of like when when you, when you have a serifed print, it really kind of like lead guides your eye from letter to letter and connects things, um, which wasn't really the case in, in early web when you had really bad monitors and like serifs were kind of like gritty and like not as, as well rendered. But now that we have screens that are just as great, honestly, as type as like as printed type, it that doesn't matter anymore. So serifs have always been really popular in print, and it could be that like now now that the web is moving more towards print quality. People are bringing more print standards into it. So when you're looking for a font, uh, families are always better than loners. So uh, there's a lot of fonts on Google Web Fonts that are just, you'll either just get like a regular weight or maybe a regular and a bold. You might not get italics. So when you're looking for a font, you should lean more towards something that has multiple weights, that has italics, or obliques, uh, just so you get that full range and you don't need to worry about the, the browser kind of rendering things for you. And you can also steal pairings. There are a couple different sites that uh, list um, good font pairings from either Typekit or from Google Web Fonts or other resources. Um, one of them is uh, Hello Happy. Do -do -do. Yeah, here we go. Uh, by Chad Mazzola. I actually think he's a Boston person. I think he works for uh, ThoughtBot. So he's, uh, he's local. But it's uh, really nice fonts from Google Web Fonts paired together. So uh, when in doubt, steal steal other people's pairings. Like, if it looks good to you, it is good. I mean, hopefully. But when you see something that you, you really like, just go ahead and, and use it. See if it applies to your specific uh, example. Um, play. I mean, really, it comes down to, like, playing. Play with the fonts that you think look good. Um, Sometimes when I'm I'm feeling like I I don't know where I should be going, like when I'm I'm just starting out with a new project and I'm like, what do I really want it to look like? I'll seek inspiration by going to either similar sites or sites by people I know uh, are really great at typography, and uh, just kind of draw from their experience and see if it fits uh, what I'm doing. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I try it out and I'm like, oh man, this doesn't actually look as good on my site as it did on theirs but it usually ends up leading me to something that is more appropriate. So, making it look good. So you have, you picked out your typeface, you know where you're getting it from, how do you make it look awesome? You know, one thing is size. This is kind of a, a trend right now, but big fonts are really in. Make it big, make it beautiful, make it bold. So, you can even, you can even see it in here. Uh, where'd it go? Big font. Does he identify fonts that he uses? Yeah, actually you hover over it and it uh, tells you what it is. I actually think, yeah, you can click and it leads you to it on Google Web Fonts. Don't be afraid to go big. Um, I feel like there was really a, a point in time where people were using like 12 pixel fonts on their site for their body text and it's just like terrible to read and I, I feel like my even my eyesight like has been going downhill rapidly. So bigger is in general a little bit better. I would never go below 14 pixels for body ever. Um, so make sure you give everything some nice size. Uh, don't make anything too small. But on contrast, you know, make sure you're not making it super big and awkward. So it's really like a balance of playing, like what is right for the project that I'm working on. So if you go to say a 14 point on something that is going to be on, seen on a monitor, how does that translate to the to the uh, telephone, to the mobile site? Um, it's all kind of different. <laughs> so if you find that it looks good on the web, like if it looks good on your laptop, but it doesn't look good on your phone or your tablet, just bump it up a little bit. Um, usually translates pretty well. 
Um, but this is what responsive is for, is, is being able to adapt to your sizes uh, depending upon, you know, whether or not. A lot of it is, you know, you look at it and you can tell if it's too small or you can tell if it's too big. Um, on my own site, uh, I make my headers just a little bit smaller to fit better, just so, like, the, the lines aren't as ragged. So it's a lot of uh, try something, reload, try something, reload, kind of see what looks good. method to um, have a different font size or that matter style render if you're accessing the site via the web, uh, excuse me, via mobile versus? Yeah, uh, just media queries. You can do it with. Media queries? Yeah. Okay. I don't know about those. Okay. Um, I'll look it up. <laughs> uh, they are pretty much what powers responsive design. Uh, so you can say between uh, like 1024 and, se and 768 and like whatever I want uh, this range between 300 and 600 I want this and you could actually like change your style sheet based upon the range uh, like the pixel range you've specified uh, you could also do this for uh, screen resolution so you can load different images um, depending upon if somebody has a retina screen or uh, like a non retina screen so um, for some good example there's media queries and it just shows you uh, just responsive sites. And you can kind of see how uh, the headers have kind of scaled proportionally while the, like, the bodies have stayed the same, like here on uh, The Great Discontent. Yes? So you're talking in pixels, but I've been starting to see more M's. Yeah. Uh, so I, like, I kind of conceptualize everything as pixels. Um, based on that most uh, most major browsers have a 16 pixel basis and then from then you can you can scale uh, proportionally using M's um, pixels is how I think of it M's is how I do it I guess um, yeah well the good the good thing about uh, M's is that you can actually set it yourself so you can set um, one thing I like to do is actually set my body to be 10 pixels and then so when I'm using M's, uh, so like 1.6 M's would be 16 pixels. So that's like one way to do it, just one technique. So is that a trend that you think is going to Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think re people are really moving away from absolutes and more into fluidity of everything, um, of images, of type. Uh, so uh, especially as responsive becomes, I mean, it already is mainstream, but as it becomes like the standard, um, it's it's really about uh, like being relative and not about declaring like you know this has to be 16 pixels etc. Which website is that? Is this that is uh, media queries. Media so queries. yeah, instead of dot com, it's just dot es. Oh, that didn't work. If you if you Google media queries, it might come up, although it might not. So one of the biggest defenders of bad type on the web is line height. So line height is the space between lines. Um, I think most browsers tend to do uh, 1.2 times the size of your body font is your default, and that's really often too small. Um, for body font, you really want 1.4 to 1.6 times the height or the size of your font. So in this case, uh, if you're using M's and you have it set, you can you could actually just uh, you could do 1.4 M's. I actually think you don't even need that. I think you just do 1.4 or 1.6, etc. This is another thing where like you really have to eyeball it. So a good measure is to like kind of squint at your screen, and if you uh, if you can see everything kind of like blurs nicely um, and it like still kind of looks connected then it, it's good but if it uh, if it either looks like different like different things it's too much and if it looks like one solid chunk it's too little but I mean I always do 1.4 to 1.6 um, the only exception is headers sometimes need a little less space and another thing that's good to do with media queries is you could have you know 1.4 but if your font gets smaller you know, on mobile, you give it a little bit more room. So the smaller, 
your font size is kind of the more room you need, and then the bigger, the less you need. There's also line length. This is another like big offender of type on the web. Um, your, your lines shouldn't be big, especially if you have a responsive site. You shouldn't go too big sometimes with your type. So if you, even if you've like optimized your site for super big screens, your type shouldn't take up the entire screen. It's just super hard to read, especially if you think back to when the web, like nobody really put a width on the web and it was dependent upon your screen size. Sometimes you just get like lines of text forever and ever. <laughs> Um, so the kind of the, the, the rule is 50 to 75 characters per line. And you know, this is kind of like, like with everything, it's kind of, a, it depends. So if it looks right and like it feels right, it usually is right. So now, how do I, how do I put this into WordPress? The fastest way would be to use a plugin. Uh, there are plugins that'll tap into Google Web Fonts, so you could just pull it in straight from there. You don't even know to, need to go to the site. There's a, I always use a plugin just to do Typekit. Um, you just plug in. It means, like, the good thing about using a plugin is you don't need to alter usually your style sheet. So you can e either use a, it'll, some of them will let you actually, like, edit your CSS through their plugin, which means that if you don't have the plugin, you don't have those edits anymore, but it also means that if you're working on top of something and you don't want to child theme it or you don't want to like change the theme itself. So like if you're working off of like 2012 and you like love 2012 and you don't want to child theme it, you can use a plugin to change the font so you just get like a little bit of change. You could also add it manually and there's a bunch of different ways to add type manually. So I'm going to go through a couple different uh, use cases for Google Web Fonts. Sure. So I usually, at this point, uh, most of my WordPress work is uh, personal. Um, most of the ones I'm doing dev for are like projects. So uh, let's see. So I'll use the just a quick Typekit plugin. And you, uh, with Typekit, you're given an embed code. So, not this one. Uh, well, just one general tip with looking for plugins. Make sure that the plugins you're looking for have been updated recently and are compatible with uh, the current version, which is 3.5. Uh, yeah, I think it's this one. Um, you, you just plug your embed code in and it, it does all the work for you. Um, and then since anything I use it on, I, I write my own style sheets for. I'll, uh, I'll just bring them in where I need them. But there's a, uh, with plugins, it's really just like search for it and hope you find something good. Like the directory is kind of a pain to deal with. So sometimes even just Googling it might be a little bit faster. So uh, with this plugin, um, it gives you, let's see if it has any screenshots. Yeah, so it'll look like this. So you just enter your uh, your type kit embed code. Oh yeah, and then you can overwrite uh, your CSS from here. Um, so you would just be like, oh, on my body, I want to like my family should be open sans. Where, where would you paste the code? You'd paste your embed code here, and then change your CSS here uh, if you wanted to go this route. Um, and you don't need to put it anywhere else; it just does it for you. So you do this through your uh, WordPress admin, actually. Uh, so you were in the back end there just a minute ago. Yeah, this is a screenshot of the back end. Oh, okay. So, two. So the plugin provides a space for you to insert this code without having to insert it manually. Yeah. So uh, you just drop your you drop your uh, embed code that Typekit gives to you here. Uh, and then if you were making, if you were working on a theme and you didn't want to change the theme file, so this is especially important if you're like buying pro themes and you don't want to change them, you don't want to actually like change the codes because then you can't, you can't update them later without overwriting. Or if you're like working off of something, especially something like 2012, 2011 that do get updated, you want to make sure that you're not 
putting it directly into your style sheet because then when you update, it'll overwrite. So, you know, one way to get around that is to child theme. A child theme is kind of just like a, a theme that sits on top. It's like a skin almost. Um, but you could, you know, with a plugin like this, just write your uh, custom CSS in here and it like throws it on top. So it's, it's kind of doing the same concept. So with Google Web Fonts, too many tabs open at this point. Uh, let's say we want to use Open Sans. Uh, it's a beautiful sans serif that I love. Actually, I already have it here. And you can choose uh, the different weights you want. Um, so one of the things I love about Open Sans is it has a light and it has a semi-bold. Um, I kind of really love lights and semi-bolds. So you can choose. Oh, it's a book, not light, but... And then you know that you're going to want italics for your body, but you might not need it for your headers. So then, down here, uh, it gives you a couple different ways to insert. So in this case, uh, you just copy it, if it lets me. You can copy it and then paste it into your site. So this is what this would be if you have your own custom theme or if you have a child theme. Um, I don't ever use the the actual editor, but it's easier to show it here. Oh, it defaults to it. Okay. Oh, I want my header. Sorry. So in this case, I just throw it up here. Um, you just want to put it like above the uh, the PHP WP head. Um, so you just paste it in, and then you can call it in your style sheet. Um, and that would look like it would look like this. So you could just throw the, the font you just added to the, the front of your current font stack. But you can also import it directly into your style sheet. So instead of putting it in the header of your, uh, like your header.php, uh, you can just copy this and then paste it straight into your style sheet itself. So let's just throw this up the top. And that just draws it, it straight in. Uh, I love Google Web Fonts because it's so easy. You just copy paste. You could also uh, use JavaScript. This would be good, especially if you were doing sort of any sort of like custom loading, um, or if you wanted it to load uh, in a specific way. You wanted to add any effects to it. You know, you could just edit the JavaScript itself. Um, there's no reason other than that I, w I would ever use the JavaScript instead of using uh, the standard or the add import. Um, but I mean, there are use cases definitely for it, but it's more of like a, an advanced developer kind of use case. But if you wanted to do that, you could just copy it. And then you would throw it, uh, it's best put in your footer.php, um, like right here. You just paste it there. And uh, that would load it after the rest of your site has loaded. So you'd still, when you loaded your site, you would initially get um, your fallbacks. And then once JavaScript loads, you would get uh, the font. So there are some drawbacks to using JavaScript. But I pretty much, I pretty much always go with the standard. It's easy. I just throw it into my, my header.php. Uh, the at import would be good. Um, I feel like the only like the big use case I would see is if you're uh, if you're using something like Glass or SAS and you're using um, a, bu a bunch of different partial style sheets, you can just like add it there. Um, or if you, some people will do have, like a main.css that imports like a typography.css and like a grid.css, you could throw it in there. Then it just kind of like adds them all together. Um, but standard is usually, way, usually the way I go. Standard, import, and then. So with Typekit, so 
So I have this uh, kit editor. You can go through and search. Um, so I already have a couple different fonts in here. Um, just grab the embed code. So all, really all you do is you copy and paste that um, either into your header.php um, or if you're using the plugin, you can use, this is not the right install. Yeah, you can use it right here. So there really are like a ton of, tons of different ways to add fonts to your sites. And if you really wanted to, you could add, add it manually uh, with add font face. So this is uh, what's known as the, like, the bulletproof add font face syntax. Uh, if you do it like this, you're always going to get the right fonts. Um, so it calls a bunch of different files, so you need to have all these files uh, for it to be able to read. Um, like in, in some cases, like Chrome doesn't read some version, and Safari doesn't read a different version, and blah, 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 blah. So this is the way to get it all uh, without missing a font. Uh, and if you wanted to go this route, um, you'd have to f uh, host them yourself. Um, but a good site that does that, actually, uh, it, it generates all of the different formats is Font Scroll. So they have add font face kits that you can download. And they have tons of different ones. So you download the kit, and it comes uh, pre-prepared with not only the CSS that you need to throw into your style sheet, um, but also the different font files. So it'll give you everything you need. Uh, this is what I used uh, back really before Google Web Fonts or Typekit existed, but now it's kind of a, a little bit of an outdated method. But it's good if you want to do the hosting yourself, which could be uh, important if you're working on, I don't know, very like closed in networks or something. And that's it. Any questions? If you Google uh, bulletproof at font face, you should get this uh, syntax. Yes? Illustrator, actually. Um, although I recently got uh, whatever is on Mac. Um, uh, Keynote. I recently started using that for some presentations at work. Um, and I like it, but I like uh, Illustrator just because it gives me like a fine grain control and I can use artboards as slides. Yeah. Do you know of any good font resources for things like Illustrator to, that you can pull into to use it for your presentations? Maybe not necessarily, but you can use these web-based fonts for something like this? Yeah, totally. Um, especially if you're, uh, if you're using Google Web Fonts, you can actually download the fonts themselves. Um, or any, any other free fonts or fonts that you buy, you can use in Illustrator um, or Photoshop. Uh, so, yeah, cool. Um, I just, you know, download them and use them, and they usually look okay. Sometimes, you know, the good thing about Illustrator is that you have such a great deal of control over your type. You can, like, self-kern or, like, just make sure everything looks really nice. So, um, any other questions? Yeah, if you, especially if you're newer to WordPress and you don't do a lot of your own development, then yeah, I would say, I yeah, then definitely the blog. A, a plugin would be the easiest way to do it. Um, it kind of does all the heavy lifting for you. So I kind of, it's kind of a, from like, yeah, most, my, my blog's like Okay. Um, I actually don't know what WordPress.com offers, but I'm pretty sure they, they have to have at least like one plugin that'll allow you no. to use different fonts. No None? Plugins. Are you no kidding me? No plugin? No plugin. Oh my god. That's ridiculous. Well, that's why it's WordPress.com. Right. 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 You, you used to be able to use type kits with WordPress.com. You can't anymore though? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, no. <laughs> they do not allow plugins. Yeah. No plugins, I think. I think in more recent versions they have added some, some web font options. 
I think you can buy an upgrade to do some custom fonts, but there are no plugins. Uh, actually, I haven't used WordPress.com a lot. Um, okay, well, I hope that they that changes soon, because that's kind of silly that they don't let you do that yet. I wouldn't expect it, because they're trying to create sort of a one-size-fits-all for the 99%, mm -hmm. you know, and they don't want people messing it up with their own customization. I guess that makes sense. I mean, they really carefully choose the themes that they allow, and then yeah. you, I mean, you could choose a theme that already has, like, really nice right. type, but... That's their philosophy. Yeah. But if you're on if you're on .org, you have the you know the ability to use any plugin that you want. It's self-hosted, so whatever you would pay for just hosting. But then you uh, I mean it's pretty easy to install WordPress with um, like zero knowledge. There's a lot of uh, a lot of hosts will actually do like a one-click install for you. So then, like, once you get back into the into the dashboard, it's all kind of the same thing. So. Cool. Any last questions? Great. Thank you.